third thing we're worried about is the tile. The tile here is zero, 01. If we look at YYCHR and move around the screen, we see that the bank shows up here. Bank is the same as tile. So let's go to zero, 01. Zero, 01 is right here. That's why when we move that little object around the screen, it happens to be a square. So let's find another object like this one here. This is bank 2A, as you can see in this window below. We go into the code, change this to 2A, save our code, go back, compile the code, run it, and we'll see that we now have a different shape to move around. So just like we could edit Mario sprites, we can also easily edit the sprite that you're moving around the screen or easily edit which one you want it to be. So now you can go ahead and draw on this, just like we did with Mario. It's going to change our sprite that we have. Save it. We're still looking at 2A there. Now we see that our sprite is much bigger and uglier, but it is has changed, which is really important. We don't like that sprite anymore. All we have to do is go back to the code. Let's change it back to 0, 01 again. That's what it was in the beginning. We'll save, go back, file. Now our sprite is that lovely square again. Right, so now you know how the sprite is loaded onto the screen. Right, the next thing we have here is a little part that says enable only the first square wave channel. We're not going to talk about music or sounds today, but we need to turn on the first square wave channel or the first tone. And this is what it does. It enables it. Then we turn on the screen. As we said, the screen was off earlier because we're loading all of the information. In this portion, we turn on the screen. We set the scroll to zero so that way we see that first screen. And then what we do is go into an infinite loop. So the code continues to run and looping. But as you know, things happen. But it doesn't look like much is happening in the loop. And that's because we, while this is looping, the program is now controlled by something called an NMI. We're going to take a look at that. It's the most important part of this code. Scrolling down, we find the NMI near the bottom. The NMI happens 60 times a second, and it is our timed loop. Hit up, and every 60 times a second, um, as, as the NMI occurs, which stands for a non-masking interrupt, these two things are called. We have JSR, which means jump to subroutine. We have subroutine, which updates the sprites. We have a JSR, which means jump to subroutine controller test. So what do we do? 60 times a second, we update the sprites on the screen. That means you get to see where the sprite is moving. And we go to a controller test, which checks for button presses. Then we see RTI. That means return to interrupt. So as you can see right here, 60 times a second, we update the sprites, we check for the controller, and then we wait. When that 60th of a second is over, we go back, we do the same thing over and over and over again. So all we do in this very simple code is update the sprites, check the controller. Update the sprites, check the controller, over and over and over again. Let's take a first look at the first thing that happens, updating the sprites. Scroll all the way back up, you see this subroutine, JSR update sprites. That means jump to subroutine, update sprites. Well, here we are at the update sprite portion. We set the low byte of the RAM address, the high byte of the RAM address, and we start a data transfer. doesn't seem like it might not mean a lot to you, but what this does is take our sprite data and copy it so that way the PPU can display the sprites on the screen. Once that's done, we RTS, which means return to subroutine. So once the, the, the sprites have been updated and shown on the screen, we go all the way back down to here. Now we're at the next line. 
It says JSR, jump to subroutine controller test. Now we're going to do the controller test. Let's go back up to controller test. This long part we're skipping is what we're going to get to right now. Possibly the most important part of the NMI. Controller test. First thing we do is load into the accumulator the old uh, the buttons that were just pressed. Then we store them in something called old buttons. These are variables that we set in the beginning. We're going to go through the logic of how this controller test works, but we're not going to get too deep into it because it does work. And as long as you understand the logic, you can understand how to have the controller do what you want. We strobe the joypad. That we send two bytes to the joypad, and then it starts sending our data back. We start checking the state of each button. Here, we do something a little bit complicated. We take the old buttons, we compare them to the new buttons to see what's changed. We store that in a variable. This will allow us to avoid multiple button presses from getting through. Most games or demos, you don't want to do that. Because if you didn't do that, you hit down one time, you might hold it down too long and skip through a menu that you might want to just go down one selection in. So, again, this code just allows us to make sure buttons aren't being held down too long. After that, we actually check every button. As you see, check up, check down. We're going to have check left, right, A, B, select, start. We'll go through every button on the NES, Famicom, or $10 computer controller. This first line here checks if the up button was pressed. If the button wasn't pressed, it, go, it jumps down to check down. So notice this line is commented out because up, down, left, and right control the sprite. Remember I said that this part of the code allows us to make sure the buttons weren't held down too long? Well, for this example, we actually want the buttons to be held down. If you hold down up, we want you to go up with the sprite. We don't want you to hit up, 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 up a hundred times to get to the top of the screen. So we comment this line out and we just compare it to the current button being pressed. So if the up button was pressed, it's going to do everything in here. If not, it's going to branch to check down and it's going to see if the down button was pressed. So that's how the NES works. It checks every button. It checks up, down, left, right. It's going to go through all of them. So let's say the up button was pressed. The first thing you're going to do is decrement 500, which is a memory location. This decrements or decreases the vertical position of the sprite. So that means that the sprite is going to move up. When you hit up, the sprite moves up because you're decreasing the vertical position of the sprite in memory. This next part is pretty complicated. And if you can understand this and edit this later, then you're doing very well. This is what makes sure the sprite doesn't go past that top of the box. If you remember in our code, if you go too far, you hit a space that doesn't allow you to go any further. And you hear that tone. 